Bismillah. Bismillah wa hamdillah wa salat wa salam ala rasulullah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah kathirin. Alhamdulillah, Allah is most merciful to give us the opportunity to come together tonight to talk about matters of importance for us as a community. We pray that Allah Ta'ala make it beneficial for all of us and that he guide my tongue and your tongue and our intentions in a way that is pleasing to him and in the way of his beloved prophet Muhammad alayhi salat wa salam. Alhamdulillah, as we promised uh, at the khutbah, our topic uh, for tonight is uh, keeping the faith, our children and the challenge of higher education. Keeping the faith, our children and the challenge of higher education. So, alhamdulillah, what I want to talk about this uh, issue in three parts. Uh, one uh, is in terms of context, C-O-N-T-E-X-T. -E uh, secondly, in terms of the cave, and I'll explain what I mean by the cave uh, uh, in a moment. And the third is in terms of challenges that we and our children face uh, in this situation, and, that, uh, and some thoughts about uh, what we might do about it together. So let's talk a little bit about context. Uh, I was talking to some of my colleagues before I came over, and I was reminded that I should tell all of us and remind myself is that uh, the MSA won't save you. The Muslim Student Association won't save you. That's to say that if we have not done a good foundational job with our young Muslim students, if they don't come into college with a strong uh, Islamic background and strong morals and strong values and a strong notion of what right and wrong is, it's going to be a very, very difficult goal for them. The MSA won't save you, telling them that, you know, you got to join the MSA uh, in, in many ways is very, very late. And so many of you who are sitting here, mashallah, You've done a strong job of giving your children the Islamic base, making sure they learn Quran, and making sure they learn proper adab. But know that this, this tarbiya is critical to developing the kind of leadership we need for our families and our communities. If we don't do this, and by the kind of tarbiya I mean is the kind that is a balance between the fundamentals of our deen in terms of keeping the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the boundaries of Allah to Allah and the love for our deen. I mean, unfortunately, many of us come from context where we don't talk about love and Islam together enough because we all put that off as some Sufi stuff. But the reality is, first, we should love our Prophet, and we should love our, our Lord, right? And Allah, to, Allah talks about love throughout the Quran. And so we shouldn't be shy to, to encourage our, our children to love this deen. It should not be a harsh religion. It should not be a religion of do's and don'ts. And so the context that young people are dealing with today is very different from the context that I dealt with over 64 years ago. Okay. So the context that, I, uh, that I'm that young people are dealing with today is extremely different from the context that I dealt with uh, more than 50 years ago. I, I graduated from high school in 1964. People go, ooh, right, that was a long time ago. And things were very, very different at that particular time. Uh, that there was something called in loco parentis, right, in loco parentis, that colleges were seen uh, this is uh, uh, in, uh, a, a Latin term that we're seen to being instead of your parents. And so when I went to college, I went to a historically black college. It's called Hampton University. It was called Hampton Institute at that time. The girls were on one side of the campus and the boys were on the other side of the campus. And uh, if you were caught on the wrong side of the campus after Maghrib, they didn't call it that because they weren't Muslims, right? But after sundown, after sundown, if you were caught on the wrong side, you'd get a demerit. You would be in trouble with the dean of students. This is a secular university. I mean, it was started by the, uh, like many uh, of the historically black colleges, by a Christian organization. But really, it was a secular institution 
But it, during those times, the colleges were in local parentheses. They, you know, I, I literally, I went back to the 25th uh, reunion of Hampton University, and I had a kufi on, right? I, I was not, I had not taken shahada when I was there. And I walked into uh, uh, one of the, now they have a coed dormitory, uh, where almost everybody has them now. But even their coed dormitories at that time were boys on one floor and girls on the next. I know they're young men and women, but boys on one floor, girls on the next, and you shouldn't be on the, boys shouldn't be on the girls' floor, that kind of thing. And so I walked in the dorm mother, that's what we called them. We called them dorm mothers. They're called resident advisors now. The dorm mother told me that, you know, you know better than that. You can't keep your hat on on the inside, right? She told me to take my kufi off. And you know what? I took it off. So because that's how, that's how much authority you have. Things have changed even at Hampton University in the past 50 years. And this is, this is a message to the parents. Things have changed even though many of us have gone to colleges and universities in the United States, even though we might have been born someplace else. We need to understand that things have changed in the last 50 years. I saw this phenomenon even amongst non-Muslims. That is to say that the school where I taught was founded by Catholics, by Catholic nuns. And, and they became coed in the 1970s. The people in many of the Catholic communities still thought the nuns ran the school. There were very few nuns there when I got there and came on faculty. So that's my first point, that things have changed and that the culture, that the culture that you find on campus is a very, very different one. There are two levels of this culture. One is something, uh, is the societal level. And what I mean by this, and I, I like to recommend books because I'm, uh, I'm a bibliophile, I love books. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, there's a book called The Culture of Disbelief. The Culture of Disbelief uh, by uh, someone named Stephen Carter, uh, C-A-R-T-E-R-S-T-E-P-H-A-N. Uh, in it, he makes an argument that in American society, and this is an old book, right? It's, uh, I think it's 2009, it's pretty old. But I think it's still apt today that in this American society, most people are pressured to act as if their dean does not matter, that their religion does not matter in terms of making decisions. Or they were practiced, they're pressured to act as if their dean only matters politically. Let, let me talk about, let me unpack both of these. The first, uh, there, there's, a, there's, there's a push in American society to say, well, that's a private matter here, that, you know, religion, that's your business, what you do, what you believe, that's your business, and you should, that's between you and your God. And so therefore, they don't want to engage any discussion about your making decisions based on your morals in the public square. And we can talk about this in, in Q&A. The, the other part of this is that, as you've seen with the recent Roe v. Wade and the, the packing of the Supreme Court by the far right, that, that's, that's, who they, that's who they are, they act as if their, their dean only matters politically. And what do I mean by this? These people uh, want have put people on, on the Supreme Court by backing somebody whose moral values in no way lines up with their dean, right? The, the moral values of the man who put, I don't, I don't want to name this person, because this is not the point, right? The moral values of the man who put these conservative, far right, very religious, mainly Catholic, by the way, most of the uh, people on the Supreme Court, Catholic, that's another whole story, on the Supreme Court, is a person whose moral values, if they were a regular church member, they'd be kicked out, right? Right, because of adultery, because of lying, because of stealing, because of cheating, because of bullying. These are all documented things that this person does, but the, these people support him for the political implication, and they're arguing that their dean only matters politically. This is what, uh, what Stephen Carter calls political preaching, right? Political preaching, in other words, rather than looking at your moral values within your dean, you decide your position and then you go into your text and find, the, for us, this Quran and for the Christians of the Bible, and find the verses that support it. 
And so the context, there's a larger American context, right? So, uh, and we need to understand that. So, so what's the context on American college campuses? As I said before, 50 years ago, it was very, very different. Many campuses were in local parentis, and many campuses cared more about the moral values, the moral values of people who went there. And, and there's still, there are notable examples like uh, Brigham Young University, which is a, 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 a Mormon university, and some other universities, and some very conservative, uh, like Liberty University. But the vast majority, even of the ones that are affiliated with churches, are not as concerned about the moral development. So this is something you, if you're thinking about going to college, you're thinking about sending your youngster to college, you should be thinking about it. Let's think about some statistics here. Uh, I want to cite two studies, and so you'll understand the context that young Muslims are facing as they're going into college and, and as you make a decision about higher education. Number one, one study was done in 2014 by uh, Dr. Wahiba Abu Ras, who was a friend of mine, uh, uh, with a couple of other people, uh, about behaviors among Muslim college students. This is 2014. So the data are pretty old, but I would argue that it's probably gotten worse. The short story, and you can look this up, it's. Uh, the name of the article is Behaviors Among Muslim College Students. Uh, and it's, uh, it was published by FYI, which is an organization that looks at youth issues and trying to help and support youth. What they found in the data, and you can, you can dig through it, is that 46.2% of the Muslim participants had participated in drinking alcohol in the year before. That's almost half, right? That 24.6% had participated, that's, uh, that's almost a quarter, that's one in, one in four, had participated in illicit or illegal drug use, that's separate from alcohol, that 30.4 had participated in gambling. Now, in 2014, uh, it wasn't, gambling wasn't ex as accepted in the broad of American society. Now you can do sports betting. Uh, 2014, in most states, you couldn't do sports betting. It's been widely accepted. So even back then in 2014, 30.4% of the Muslims admitted to gambling in the year before. And, and then amongst the never married students, 53% had admitted being involved in sexual intercourse in the year before. And so the majority of those people who had done at least one of these things, right, uh, most, right, had participated, 58% of the Muslim college students, I'm not talking about the general population, the Muslim college students surveyed, 58% had participated in at least one of these risky behaviors, gambling, sexual intercourse, illicit drug use, and this is, this is very, very, this is something we should take, take heed of, and of that 58%, 77% had been involved in at least two of the risky behaviors in the year before. So this should alarm us because things have changed on college campuses and that, that the colleges are more, uh, more concerned with treating youngsters who are 18 to 22 year olds as adults, as independent adults. And many of us at 18 to 22 year, years old, I, I certainly didn't have the tools to be an independent adult. And I don't believe, this is my opinion, that youngsters today have the tools to be independent adult. Definitely not at 18. They should be there by 22 years old, but if they get proper tarbia. So th that's one point. That's old data. Uh, more recently, some data that was, I believe was collected in 2019, and some of you know uh, about this in relationship to a tragedy that happened here in DFW, is data on suicide, right, inclination. Uh, uh, there's a study done, and I'll give you the name of it, you can look it up yourself, called the, uh, the, 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 I'll find the title in a moment, Suicide Attempts of Muslims with Other Religious Groups in the United States. Uh, two of the authors are friends of mine, Dr. Rania Awad, who's a psychiatrist who teaches at Stanford University, is on the faculty of the Islamic Seminary of America. 
uh, and uh, uh, a sister, uh, Ebony Jackson Shaheed. I, I taught her, she grew up in the masjid that uh, I, I pray in that was established by Imam Zaid Shaker, whom many of you know. Uh, she went to, she went to, she went off and went to school. She she got a master's in public health. She did a post uh, master's at Yale University, and she was a co-author of this study. What was found alarmingly in this study is that Muslims, and I think some of you've heard this before, are more than two times more likely to report an attempt of suicide than Protestants. Subhanallah. The Muslims, and this is 2019, this is not so long ago, this is before COVID. Listen to me, this is before COVID, before the mental health pro problems came around uh, because of COVID. So Muslims are more, more than twice as likely than Protestants, atheists, agnostic, Jews, and Buddhists. This, is, this should concern us, right? You know, because we know the prohibition against taking your own life, right? You know, we can talk about what's haram and halal, but the reality is that if people are attempting uh, a suicide, we should be thinking about uh, what to do about it. And uh, Dr. Ronnie, aside from teaching about it on our faculty, teaching it within our courses, she was running workshops. She has an organization called Meristan that's running workshops, and she's running workshops for imams, because we really need to deal with this issue. Uh, I, I, see. The mental health context here is a very, very important one. In the United States, mental health in general is a major problem, some significant indicators of it. Number one, we have a major suicidal uh, risk problem amongst people in the armed forces. I've forgotten the numbers. I mean, they're very high, particularly people who've been stationed overseas. They're very high risk for suicide, subhanAllah, right? And we have a serious opiate drug problem. This is, a, this is a mental health problem. We have a serious opiate drug problem in the United States of America. When I was about to retire from my faculty position at Manhattanville College, uh, what I was seeing in those past years, I retired in December of 2019, I was seeing more and more young people who were not Muslims, it's coming from the general population, who were having difficulty with depression, and anxiety that was so difficult for them that many of them ended up dropping out. So the country, this country has a major mental health problem and mental health often affects physical health. The, the past couple of years, the average life expectancy of Americans has gone down, subhanAllah. So we, we should be aware of all of this. When we do, this is why our tarbiyah is so, so, so very important. It would be important in quote so-called normal times, but with the pandemic, with, with this, these epidemics that we have in a broad American society, we should be about the business of making sure that our, our young people understand the limits and boundaries of Islam, uh, also the love that they should have for the deen and Allah and his messenger, of course, for our family. This is a, this is a balance that we should be doing because they are facing out there in the institution that they're going to, their faces are difficult. So the context has changed, right? And the context in a larger society has changed. And the context uh, around uh, Muslims going to school has changed uh, because many young Muslims are participating in risky behaviors that they would not participate in at home. This is just a fact. Once they get away, uh, I, I, I used to tell young people, at Manhattanville College, college is one of the, f the few places that you will go in life. I'm talking about any place in life. I'm not talking about in the Muslim world, where you will live together in close proximity with somebody of the other gender, and I'm only talking about males and females now, somebody of the other gender whom you're not related to. Literally, uh, in the freshman dormitory on that campus, boys and girls, young men and women, 18 years old, for the first time away from home, they have rooms that are next door to each other, subhanAllah. And many of the young, 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 mainly white boys and girls had never been in this situation before. Just think about it for a moment. 
that you've never been away from home, you've never been out from under your parents' uh, tutelage, then all of a sudden at 18 years old, you're thrust in a situation that you have to deal with seeing boys and girls, I mean young men and young women, I'll call them young men and young women, and early in the morning, late at night, and in that dormitory, in that dormitory, there were common bathrooms. In other words, you did not have bathrooms in your room, whereas is often the case in the older dormitories. So you, no, males and females did not share the same bath like they do at Yale University. One of my alma maters, they do that at Yale University, but they don't do it in Manhattanville, at least not while I was there. But in the morning, you have to walk down the hallway to take a shower or go to the bathroom. And people are often walking down the hallway like they used to walk down the hallway at home with almost nothing on. And this is a shock to the young people coming from home. So I, I want you to understand that, that a person going from home to college, if they go away, if they go away to college, they're going to face these kind of challenges. They're not very simple. They're not very simple for people who are not Muslim, and they're even more challenging for people who are Muslim. Okay, so that's the context we're dealing with. And so, so what about this cave thing? So how do you deal with this situation? One is, uh, is to you know, stay home, right, and don't go to college. Now, I know this sounds like a radical idea, uh, but everybody should not go to college. Just because your parents went to college doesn't mean that you should go to college. I mean, I know this is radical. I mean, it, it just is not, I mean, people often say, that a college degree is like a high school diploma. But there are so many other things that you can learn to do and learn to do responsibly. It sounds odd coming from somebody who made his living, you know, by taking money from people. My, my salary was paid by tuition. But there were some people in college who did not belong there. Their parents might have been PhDs, their parents might have been doctors, their parents might have been lawyers, but they did not belong in college. Why? because they didn't have the aptitude or the attitude to do the work. And what I mean by aptitude, they were sometimes pressured into being medical doctors. When they weren't, they, they didn't have STEM background. They didn't like it. They couldn't do it very well. I had several students, they weren't Muslim, by the way, I thought you, I know you think they were Muslim, whose families had pressured them to be medical doctors, and they were flunking biology and chemistry and math. I said, hey, uh, hello in there, I think uh, you need to think about, you need to think about this. But my mother wants me to be a medical doctor, but you really, you really need to think about this. Then there's a, another whole group of young people, there's a whole, another group of young people who, um, who just don't want to be in college. The only reason they're in college is that their parents said, I'm going to kick you out if you don't go to college. All right, so they're, they're on parent welfare, right? The parents are taking care of them. They're taking food, clothing, shelter, health care. And so they go to college. But then they, they don't have the attitude that they need because being at home and doing homework and doing homework on your home, these are two different things. They don't have the attitude to do it. And so the point is, is understand that, 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 that these people might not be the best people for college. The other group of people who might stay home are people who they don't have the, 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 the strong Islamic uh, learning, the strong Islamic character. They, they really ought to go to community college or commute to a four-year college because the reality is that the ethos of the, uh, uh, the um, most American college is very secular and it goes against the values of Islam. I mean, it's just, in, in Christianity and other things as well. Okay, so, so what, the, what does a cave have to do with it? <clears throat> Many of us read Surah Kaf, give me, excuse me. So many of us read Surah Kaf every, uh, every Juma, and <clears throat> we know that one of the first stories in the Surah is the young men in the cave. And so uh, the reality is, is that for me the Surah embodies different approaches to living in a society 
where Muslims are not the majority. The whole surah embodies that, if you look at it. And there are many uh, people, Mufasa, people who are who qualify to do tafsir, I'm not, who talk about this, including my friend Imam Hamza Yusuf, who's a, a graduate of El Azhar University <clears throat> and an imam in Memphis, Tennessee. He talks about the fact that there are different approaches to civic engagement in Surah Kaf, right? The one, one approach is that the society is so bad that you have to separate yourself from it. And these young men, they went to the cave, right? Uh, another approach is the, the, the uh, Dhul Kitr approach, right? Uh, they're, they're wherein uh, people are out in society trying to, to, to do good. And sometimes people don't understand the good that they're trying to do, but they're trying to do good. And another is the Dhul Qanayin approach. That's to say that Allah Ta'ala gave Dhul Qanayin religious, uh, gave religious and secular authority to help people. And so, and so if you, to me, the big message, takeaway, is that everybody does not have to engage with the broader society in the same way. Some of us need to stay away because we can't handle it, let's be honest. Some of, we really can't handle it, right? And some of us have been given the knowledge and authority by Allah Ta'ala to be a benefit, and we ought to be, like our beloved alayhi salatu wa salam, was a benefit to all creation, right? It was a benefit to the, the people of Yathrib, which became the city of Medina, uh, did not come and get him to give a dawah. They came and get, got him in order to make peace. Let me say this again. The people of Yathrib didn't vote to send to get Prophet Muhammad wasalam, to come from Mecca to Medina in order to give dawah. They brought him there to make political peace. This is a very, very important point because Allah Ta'ala had blessed him with hikmah and the approach to, to settle beefs, as we call them in the street. And so let's understand that is that everybody is not equipped to do this, and so therefore everybody shouldn't do it. But the point is, is that if you look at, uh, at Surah uh, Kaf and you, you look you look at this as they have different approaches. And like I said, some people are strong enough to go on college campuses and deal with it, and some are not. And so me personally, particularly young women, I would, I would me personally, I would keep them at home because, because uh, young women who, who cover are particular targets in two ways. One, of the Islamophobes, the cowardly Islamophobes who would never yell at or harass a man but they would harass women, right? And the other is the, the people who are predators who want to pull these young sisters off their deans simply because they're Muslim women, and we've seen this, this thing happen. So uh, this is what I mean by the cave, that some people need a cave, some people don't. So that's the second point. The third point is the, what is our challenge? So I believe that the challenge of Muslims in America is threefold. And you may have heard this from me before. Uh, I like alliteration. So the, I talked about one set of three R's during the Jumal Qutbah. Here's a different set. I think there are three R's that we in this country ought to be doing as Muslims. Right. Number one is reconnect to our usul. That this is very, very important. That we as a body this may not be true to individuals here at IANT, but we as a body, if you look around at the Muslims and the Muslims in the public square, and the people who present themselves as Muslims in the public square, I won't name them, certainly these people are not connected to Quran with Sunnah. These are, and they're very prominent Muslims, I won't name them, who are out there saying things, who are out there in the midst of this pro-life, uh, pro-choice, pro-life, pro-choice debate, are who, don't, who seem to be ignoring our deen. That it has nothing, to, either they're on one side or the other without any nuanced understanding. And so the first R that we ought to do as Muslims is reconnect to our soul as a group. So we won't have so many people in the public square doing and saying things that clearly contravene what Allah and his messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, say. They, I mean, really, I'm like, 
it blows my mind. And these are people who are seen as, quote, Muslim leaders. And this comes from not having proper tarbiyah within our communities. Not that you won't have any of this, but you won't have so much of it, this if we properly raise our children, right? And so we need to reconnect to our, 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 our primary sources. The second R is that we need to reclaim the moral high ground. Instead of running behind people, pro-life or pro-choice people, we should be making our own statement based on Quran wa Sunnah on this issue of abortion. And I think it would be very different. Let's understand, what's, let's look at the statistics here of what's happening here. And I, and I don't want to go into a long thing about it, but uh, I, I think to look at statistics, you'll understand my point. First of all, 90% of the abortions that are done in America are done for people who are having sex out of wedlock. I want you to think about that for a moment. 90% of them are done, they're done for people who are having sex out of wedlock. And so this is clearly against our deen. Now, I'm, I'm not dictating what it means, but we sh this means that we shouldn't be jumping pro-life and pro-choice so quickly, right, for something that enables people to have sex before marriage. I mean, we just need to be very careful about that. The second thing about this is that people who look like me are overrepresented in the people who get abortions. And the background to this, we need to understand, and we need to wrap up now. Uh, the background to this is that Margaret Sanger, who was one of the big promoters, uh, she, she founded Planned Parenthood, uh, and uh, she, uh, uh, she was uh, very much a, an advocate. She, she wasn't very religious, an advocate of people thinking for themselves, this kind of thing. And she didn't want people who were who were not as beneficial to society to have children. She was a, a eugenicist. Now, a, a eugenics is a pseudo-scientific movement that came into vogue in the early 20th century, like 1920s, 1930s, that was led by the leading liberal intellectuals, not the conservative, the leading liberal intellectuals. What was eugenics about? There are a couple of books you can read about it. One book is called the War Against the Weak. That's the name of the book. The War Against the Weak. And I think the subtitle, America's Quest to Create a Super Race, subhanAllah. Right? This is the 1920s, the United States of America, the eugenics movement. Right? She was a backer of this eugenics movement. Uh, what, would, what did the eugenics movement do? There was a famous case in 1927, uh, uh, Buck versus Bell, that went to the United States Supreme Court. And this Supreme Court case, this Supreme Court case was about whether or not this young woman who was deemed defective, this is a young white woman from Charlottesville, Virginia. I was raised in Virginia. Uh, her name was uh, Bell. Her last name was Bell. Uh, she was taken to the Supreme Court and she was forcibly sterilized because uh, the, the court felt she was an imbecile. She was forcibly sterilized. As a result of this 1927 Supreme Court, and one of the people who, who wrote, uh, wrote the opinion for the Supreme Court, this is a very liberal justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and you, you know about uh, legal decisions, knows he's a very famous legal uh, liberal jurist, says three generations of imbeciles are enough. And so he sided with the people who wanted to forcibly sterilize this woman because she was mentally defective, right? In spite of, it, 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 there's a book called uh, Imbecile that, that talks about her case in, in, in particular. So my point about this is, is that between 1926 and the 1970s, 60,000 people were forcibly sterilized because of this Supreme Court ruling. That's a lot of people. And it started off with defective white people, and the people behind this movement were people of means and stature like John Kellogg. Anybody have cornflakes this morning? That's the same Kellogg. The cornflakes was part of that movement 
to create a master race, subhanAllah. The Germans got the idea from us. Listen to me. The Germans got many of their ideas around creating a master race from the United States of America. This is documented, documented. I'm not making this up, right? And so Margaret Sanger was a part of this movement, right? The Planned Parenthood and uh, uh, abortion and birth control was a part of this movement to create a master race. This is not a conspiracy theory. Or you can, you can look Margaret Sanger up. You can find her on YouTube talking about these kinds of things. And so if you understand this, you understand where this uh, pro-life, pro-choice movement, you need to understand something about the background of what this thing is all about. And so the eugenics movement was an attempt to create a master race and many people were forcibly sterilized because of this something that we would, we, we, we would be against in Islam. This is the same time that black people are being lynched in the United States. And so what we're talking about is a challenge that we're dealing with a situation where we come up against situations that we don't really understand and we take one side or another without really thinking about it. This is a challenge for us. And I say that because we're not, we're not connected to our usul, then we, we don't uh, really take a position that's Islamically based. The second R, first is reconnect to our, uh, our, our usul. The second is regain the moral high ground. We as Muslims should be leading on the issue of Roe versus the Board of Education, not following. Listen to me. We should be leading. Most Muslims are following. They're following either the so-called right or the so-called left. In my opinion, and I'm not a faqih, I'm not an alim, but in my opinion, neither position squares with Islam. If you take as they are, either the so-called pro-life, and if you want to ask me about it, you can, you, you can uh, I, we don't have time to unpack it. Either the so-called pro-life or the pro-choice movement does not square with Islam. And so we should be taking the moral high ground. We want a moral just society where people, right, where, where people are treated with morality and justice. That's what we're about. We're not either pro-choice or pro-life. And therefore, we should have decisions and institutions that create a healthy, just society and don't create situations where babies are born out of wedlock, born poor, and all of this kind of thing that goes on in the United States of America. Okay, so that's the second thing. We need to reclaim the moral high ground. We are so defensive, right? We are, we're seen as people who are misogynistic. We're against women. But we should be creating the leadership for justice and whatever is right. The third R that we should be doing is recalibrating. As our beloved alayhi salat wa salam, with the way he led the Muslims in Mecca, was very different from the way he led the Muslims in Medina. Listen to me. The way Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, led the Muslims in Mecca was different from Medina. In Mecca, to me, Allahu A'lam, he concentrated on Tarbiya. Why? Because it was needed. It was needed. People needed to be rehabilitated. They needed to be focusing on La ilaha they needed to understand the Qur'an. They needed to understand a different moral set than the one that the Quraysh were practicing at that time. And then when he moved to Medina, where he was in charge, there was more of a political emphasis, not Democrat, Republican, but where, where the common good was more of, of the emphasis. And so we should try to understand our context and govern ourselves accordingly based on Quran and Sunnah. So those are the three R's we should be doing. Rooted, the re reconnecting to our usul, reclaiming the moral high ground, and recalibrating as our beloved alayhi salat wa salam did. So what, how does uh, uh, Islamic Seminary of America fit into all of this? As I said in the khutbah, uh, there's something called the higher education, H-E-L-M of the, of, the, of the Churches of Christ, wherein they have only 360,000 people who belong to their group, but they have 27,000 people in higher education. Right now, as we speak, Texas Christian University is one of them. 
These are our licensed, accredited institutions that are, that are supported by this denomination. They have 27,000 adherents in their own colleges, right? That they, they have based on their own values. And uh, they have uh, 15 uh, undergraduate schools and uh, seven seminaries. We are at least three million. We barely have five seminaries, and most and all of them are not totally run by Muslims, subhanAllah, right? We have one Zaytuna, right? So this is, this is something we should be thinking about. Even if you don't support the Islamic Seminary of America, and I have some brochures, so you could, you know, you could support it by you know, giving to our endowment fund or by giving a donation. You should be thinking about how you could help us in general get more institutions of higher education, both the four-year kind and uh, the, the graduate kind, because we need leaders that are produced by ourselves. And so if you understand that, this is a challenge that we have to do. The challenge for you who are thinking about going to school and those of you who are parents is to remember that uh, those of you who are thinking about going to school, be honest with yourself about what you want to do with your life and whether or not college is the best thing for you and which college it is. Do not let, well, let, let me put it this way. In your conversations with your parents or whoever your guardian are, you should have an honest conversation about whether or not you want to go to college. I, I, I've sat and told, because I was a fir first year advisor, sat and told many people, listen, you need to tell your parents that you don't want to go to college because you're going to waste a lot of money here and time here if you really don't want to do it. And they, they might not forgive you for that. So you should at least tell them the truth respectfully. You should tell them the truth respectfully, but you, you should tell them. And I'm talking about a, a minority of people, but you should tell them. And for for the parents and the guardians who are here, remember times have changed. College is not what it used to be and the usefulness of a college education is not what it used to be. Look at the data. It's not as useful as, as it used to be. College education pulled me and my family out of poverty. I could talk a while about black poverty, but it's not the same way today because college education right now is putting many young black people into poverty because of the massive amount of student debt. I mean, tuition 50 years ago was cheap. College tuition, when I went to Yale University, went to Hampton uh, Institute, uh, when I went to uh, Hartford Seminary, the tuition was relatively cheap. The tuition has taken off. I mean, hiring somebody like me is not cheap, right? They, they paid us good salaries. The reality is things are different. and so. You should be thinking hard about this, and particularly of those of you who are thinking about taking out loans. Uh, I, I hope many of you know about a continuous charity, which is a sister organization led by Dr. Arthur Hawk, where you can get a loan interest-free, mashallah, because I know so many, particularly uh, uh, black young people who take out these easy-to-get loans in college who are strapped with 40, 50, 60, 70,000 dollars in debt, they're coming out of the college uh, at a time when the, the, the economy is very bad. They have forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in debt, and it's going to cost them a lot more than forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars to pay it back. And and you have the COVID. And I was talking to uh, the brother who brought me. You have the perfect storm. So this is a challenge for us. And we, by the way, should be on the side of people. In my opinion. To, to not to burden people with that kind of debt. Here you are, 22 years old, and you have $80,000 in debt. And the college degree is supposed to help you. And you'll be in debt for most of your life. And then they try to convince you to get a car. As I was saying uh, to the young man who brought me over, I mean, years ago, we weren't encouraged to take on debt in general in American society where we are now. Everybody's encouraged to take on debt now. Even if you don't, have any economic means. And so that's our challenge. We, uh, we really, the three R's that we, we try to live up to uh, at the Islamic Seminary of America is that we feel that our education, any Islamic higher education should be rooted in the deen, right? It should be relevant 
to the context in which we live, the United States of America, and it should be intellectually rigorous. That's what we try to do. We're trying right now to uh, uh, work out with uh, uh, INT to develop some free scholarships to go to Islamic Center of America, and we hope that some of you can join us. I'm sorry that I went on for so long, but I guess we have a few minutes for Q&A before uh, the Adhan is called. This is an excellent, excellent question. The question is that you're saying that people who haven't had the proper tarbia might not be people that should go to college. Maybe they should stay home. Maybe they should go to college from home. Because, but what are you going to do about this? If they haven't had the proper tarbia, they're going to face the same thing. No. College university campuses, those who have been on college university campuses, are like almost no place else in life. I want you to hear it. College, university, campus, where, where do you go where 18 to 22-year-olds are running the place, right? Through student government, through, through I mean, you, 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 there's no place else. And so this creates a situation where you have pressures on you that you don't find any place else. Because the other places, if you go in the workplace, everybody's not 18 to 22-year-old, right? You don't find that. You have older people who can mentor you and help you and guide you and you might be connected to people at home but if you're off on the other side of the country in college and you're mainly around 18 to 22 years old and professors who are mainly secular humanists no, this, this, is, not, this is not the same it's not the same you, 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 to me, Allahu Alam, you're better off staying home around the Muslims within a Muslim community like this, DFW has lots of Muslim activities rather than going off to a college where there's no masjid nearby, there's no Islamic chaplain, there's no MSA. That's the normal, by the way. There's no masjid nearby, there's no MSA, there's no Islamic chaplain. That's the norm. It's unusual. What you have here in DFW is unusual. You have strong MSA, you have some Muslim chaplains, and you have strong masajid. That is not the norm when people go off to college. So it's not the same, it's very different. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, this is an excellent question. The question is that I'm an immigrant who came here with different values, right? You grew up with different values from where you came from, and then you had children here, and they grew up with different values. It's, it's the same for me, actually, even though I didn't come, I came from the South. But even today, down here, in Texas and Virginia and Georgia, the moral values in these states is very different than in Connecticut and where I live. You got it? Very, very different. I'm talking about the people. I'm not talking about the government. It's extremely different. Let's understand that. And, and it's very different 50 years ago, okay? And so how do you talk to them? Let me, uh, my experience of having, you know, uh, uh, 15 children, a lot of children, uh, and about 30 uh, grandchildren, and I've been, uh, I've learned, they've taught me a lot. They, these children have taught me a, a great deal. And so most of what I've learned, I've learned, by making my mistakes, so I'm not talking down. But here's my point, that we, uh, I, first of all, Quran is basic, and many of you already do this. Teaching your children to love and know the Quran early is critical, critical, critical. 
It's critical. You don't wait until they're teenagers, please. You know, people wait until they, no, no. After they've been, you know, had, after Disney has had them for several years, you don't wait to try to give them the Quran, right? So it, it's, it's very, very, it's very, very critical. So that's number one. Quran is basic. The, the people who are the best of it is teach young children to love Quran early, mashallah. That's number one. Number two is that you teach them to love Allah and His Messenger, alayhi salat wa salam. You can teach this. You teach this very early and that, that the rules are important but they're not the core of Islam. There are fewer rules in the Quran than there are admonitions of love, what Allah loves, what Allah hates. I mean, I mean this is a nuance, but, but the reality is the teaching them to love Allah and His message. That's the second. The third thing is talk to them in a way that respects them as a human being. And I'm not talking about this you know, I'm your buddy thing. Uh, there's, a, there's a book, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the book, uh, by a medical doctor who talks about the collapse of parenting, right? Where in the United States, you know, many uh, Americans want to be their children's friends instead of parents. This is not what we need. But on the other hand, we should keep the lines of communication open between us and the youngsters such that they could understand that, that you can talk, they should be able to talk to you about anything. As people, as the Sahaba, uh, may Allah be pleased with them, were, were able to approach our beloved Salaam with anything, your children should be able to, to be able to approach you without saying, ah, ya haram, I'm going to kick you out of my house. No, they should be able to talk to you. They should be, and this is the critical, I think these are the critical things. The Quran first, teaching them to love Allah and His Messenger, and being in keeping the lines. These are the three critical things that I think have to be done to be successful, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, uh, no, I think we could uh, finish or any, yeah, uh, make it on. All right. All right uh, thank you so much for. You are being patient with me. Uh, many of you are better than I am. You should be up here. And I uh, thank you for providing an opportunity for the Islamic Seminar of America. And, and I hope to see some of you should be with us. And not all of you. All of you shouldn't be in seminary. But some of you should be with us. So please, we're trying to make it easy. Don't let money be a, a, a bar to you. We, we have scholarships for people who really want to serve the community. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wal as inna wal insana la fikus, illa ladina amini wa amini salihat, wa tawasul bil haq, wa tawasul bil sa'ah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah Hayya ala 